If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to continue this morning with our series on the Sermon on the Mount and is kingdom living relevant in a modern world? And um, so chapter 6 of Matthew, and we're going to look at verses 14 and 15, but we're going to let's start in verse 9 because I want to read the Lord's Prayer again for us, and then we'll pray. So in verse 9, Jesus is encouraging his disciples that when they pray, don't be like the Pharisees or the guys that go out and pray out in the streets and do the recognition to see how wonderful they are, and don't be like the Gentiles who use flowery words or a lot of words, but but just be real and genuine from the heart when you pray. And so he says, I want you to, when you pray, you can pray like this. And he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And after Jesus prays this prayer, these two verses I think are significant because he's following really about forgive our debts as we also forgive our debtors. When he says in verse 14, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is verse 14 says, if, for if you forgive others their trespasses or sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others in their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you have done for us. And Lord, I just ask that today as we talk about this issue of forgiveness and unforgiveness and what it does to us, I just pray, oh Lord, that you would help us to see what you have done. Because forgiveness is not something that we do naturally. When we forgive, that is something that is supernatural. That is only can be done through your grace and your mercy. And so, Father, I want to thank you for this today. As we look at forgiveness, let us keep in mind that of how you forgave us our sins because of what Christ has done. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just spend some time today looking at this, this topic of forgiveness because it is very clear in verse 14 and 15 that when it comes to forgiveness, Jesus is very, and God the Father and Jesus both are very serious about this issue. And if ever there was a topic that when it comes to is the kingdom living relevant in a modern world, certainly it is this topic of forgiveness. How are we as people to forgive others? And how we may talk about forgiveness, but actually doing forgiveness is very, very difficult to do. It is really a supernatural work of the Spirit of God when we forgive others. But I also want to just communicate before we jump into this issue of forgiveness, I know that this issue of forgiveness can be a sensitive topic. I understand that. Some of us come to Christ with horrible backgrounds or past experiences. Maybe some of you have come from an abuse of home, whether it was abuse, where you were abused physically or emotionally. Maybe you were molested as a child, or maybe you were raped as an adult. But whatever the pain that we are and you are experiencing, the question remains, how can I forgive someone that has done something to me that seems unforgivable? And I, and I get that. I don't want to minimize at all the pain and the suffering that you and others have experienced. And when we're talking to other people about this topic of forgiveness, it is, it is a very 
sensitive topic. You must be aware of these things. Even right now, I'm, I'm counseling a couple, and they come from, both of them come from dysfunctional homes, and both of them, and uh, one of them in particular, comes from uh, where she was sexually uh, abused. And walking this journey with them through this whole issue and finding the grace and drawing her out and them out, not only about their homes, but then about what's this issue of forgiveness look like. That's why I say I, I don't want to just sound, come across preachy today. I, I want to come across in a pastoral way to, for all of us to make sure that we understand that real issues in real people's lives cause incredible spiritual struggles. And in particular, when it comes to this issue of forgiving, forgiving people. When, like I said, things were wronged, you were wronged. And so I understand that. So I, I don't want to, again, just somehow for us to detach from reality when we walk through this issue of forgiveness, because it is a very sensitive and difficult topic. And so we're going to dive into it, and we're going to look at it a little bit, because here's the, the, my main focus point for today. Forgiveness is the foundation for kingdom living. Forgiveness is the foundation for kingdom living, because without forgiveness, without God forgiving you and me, we, there would be no kingdom living. And so forgiveness for us as believers and forgiveness for us as we walk through this, first and foremost, we're looking at, at this vertical aspect of receiving God's forgiveness. And because we have received God's forgiveness, now we're his children. It is the foundation upon which we build, and then we can move to a horizontal relationship with those around us those that we interact with, those that we maybe we might not interact with them often, but what, who have, those who have ever wronged us. And so the issue of forgiveness is, is something that is critical. And so that's what we want to look at today. And before we dive into what forgiveness is, I'm going to talk about what forgiveness isn't or what forgiveness is not. Okay? The first thing is, is that forgiveness is not earned. Okay? Forgiveness is not earned. We didn't earn God's forgiveness, so we sh as people shouldn't have people earn our forgiveness. Now, they can earn our trust. That's different. That's different than, be, than them earning our forgiveness. Now, we, we need to make sure that when we forgive, we're forgiving with nothing that they have to do to perform for us in order to earn our forgiveness. Now, they can certainly earn, like I said, our trust, and that has to be built because we'll get into this in just a moment, but this is a, a different aspect. If somebody comes and embezzles money from your business and they ask for forgiveness, you can certainly forgive them, but I hope you would not put them in charge of your books again. It just wouldn't be wisdom. There's a trust factor that's here. So when we talk about Forgiveness, what forgiveness is not, forgiveness is not earned. Second thing is, and this is a common phrase in our society, because there's going to be some things today that when it comes to the issue of forgiveness, we, you may need to say, I've got to talk to Phil about this one. Because you're going to see some things that what Jesus is saying and what the Bible says is really going to run counterculture to our thoughts on what forgiveness is, and especially in the world. And one of the things, the second thing that forgiveness is not, forgiveness is not forgetting, okay? I think one of the things that we can talk about, because when you ask people to forget their deep hurts and their deep pains, uh, that's kind of hard. You talk to somebody who's been sexually abused or physically abused or whatever, and you tell them that, oh, you know, forgiveness is forgetting. No, it's not. These are real things. They walk through this. They're going to carry this for the rest of their life. And there's nowhere in Scripture is it talking about forgiveness is and forgetting. Because we're going to get here because you're going to say, well, okay, Phil, what about this? 
But we need to see this. These people live with hurt every day of their life. And, I, and I've heard the phrase so many times. I've seen the bumper stickers, forgive and forget. And I'm sitting there thinking, that is so unbiblical, so unbiblical, I don't even see that in the Scripture here. And so what I, am, what I do see is that what I do see is this. I see this Scripture of Isaiah 43, 25, where, where God is saying to them, I I am he who blots out your transgressions, your sins, for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Okay? And then we also have in Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will forgive them their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So does that mean that an omniscient God who knows everything, past, present, future, he knows every situation that you've gone through in your life, he knows the, uh, he knows the potential of decisions that will happen if you make this decision. He knows all things. How can an omniscient God forget something? He doesn't forget it. What he says is, I'm not going to remember it anymore. And that's a, that's, there's the difference. You see, when you say forget, forgetting is passive. Forgetting is something that you don't have to put any effort into. You say, I'm just going to forget and it's passive. It doesn't cost you anything. But when you say, I'm not going to remember your sins anymore, that's different. That's active. That is God saying, look, I, I, I know what you did, but I'm not going to remember them anymore. It's not that he's forgetting it. He's like, no, I'm not going to remember it. I'm, I'm going to remove it. If it comes up, I'm just going to push it off to the side. There's a difference between forgetting and not remembering. Not remembering means I'm not going to hold this sin against you any longer. You see the difference there? It is active. It is participant. So when you tell somebody who's been abused physically, sexually, emotionally, that when they go to give somebody, you tell them to forget, just forgive them and forget about it. No, they live with it. It affects every part of their emotion, their being. Some, some even have children as a result of it. And every time they see that child, it's a fresh reminder of what's happened to them. I'm, I'm walking through this right now with this. And so as I'm sitting there walking this couple through this whole idea here of what takes place, here they've got a child, or she has a child, in the midst of pain and hurt. These are real things, real. And so when I come in here and she said, people tell me to forgive and to forget, I say, no, <laughs> there's no way you're ever going to forget. You have a living example that you're clothing and feeding it every day. How are you going to forget? But what you've got to see is that you've got to be like the Lord who says, I'm not going to remember it. This is passive. You see, when it comes to forgiveness, sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I, I, I live my life out and these things may begin to rise up and I get tempted and then whatever. But forgiveness, a lot of times, is like hitting the refresh button on your computer. You know, it's, it just gets stuck in this little whatever it is, in this computer zone or whatever. And you have to come and you gotta, you got to hit that refresh button and all of a sudden it makes everything all new again. And that's what the way it is sometimes with uh, unforgiveness. It wants to come back up. It wants to, us to remember what happened. And what we've got to do is we've got to hit that refresh button and say, no, I've forgiven them. Boop, refresh. I've forgiven them. Boop. I'm not going to remember that anymore. I forgive them. Boop. And after a while, it, it tends to... All those thoughts don't tend to come because you just keep hitting that refresh button. But forgiving and, for, uh, forgiving and forgetting, man, we, we just have to be careful when we tell people that. Matter of fact, don't tell people that. <laughs> they have to be active and not remembering because the, the temptation to, to all those emotions are going to come back up and it's going to be tempting to come in here to, to, to want to, and, and you may even question, man, did I really forgive them? No, you have. But like I say, you just have to hit that refresh button because the enemy, your emotions, everything wants to, to try to drudge up all the yuck all over again. 
And you've got to be like God who says, no, I'm not going to remember that anymore. I'm making, I'm making an active decision not to remember because I've forgiven them. Refresh. Beep. That's what we do. Forgiving and forgetting. We have to be careful on this. I just, I've just been debating, do I, do I bring this one up too? Because this one is another one that is just out there. And I just, so I'm going to do it. It's one of those things. The Bible doesn't tell us that we need to forgive ourselves. You have people that come and I get why they, why they do it. Where people say, I, I just, I can't forgive myself for what I've done. I get it. I get why they say that. I understand they're saying it because guilt and shame has come. And, 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 I, and, I'm, and I totally understand. And so a lot of times when you don't understand, when you don't understand sin and what our sin represents, the whole, the whole purpose of guilt and shame is not so that you can forgive yourself the whole purpose of guilt and shame is to drive you to a savior who will forgive you. And that is so much more better. That's what the Bible does. The Bible comes in here and tells us that guilt and shame are little trigger warnings for us to run to the cross and say, I need a savior. I've done things. But you see, what happens is we live in a world where we think everybody's good. And the problem is when you think you're good, you're running counterculture to what the Bible says that you are. The Bible says your heart is desperately wicked above all else. Who can understand it? The Bible says you're, you're a sinner because you sin. That's what we do. We have a sin nature. And so when people can't forgive themselves, what they can't forgive themselves is they think, a good person like me, why would I do something like this? I don't know if I can forgive myself. Well, you're not called to forgive yourself. You're called to run to the cross and understand that your sin is so great against the holy God, the only way that you're going to find peace and true forgiveness is to run to him, fall down, and say, Father, forgive me. I am a un man of unclean lips. I live among people of unclean lips. My heart is desperately wicked, and Lord God, the only one who can save me, the only one who can forgive me is you. Amen? I mean, that's the Bible. But when you don't bring the, when you're taking the Bible out of society, you're taking the Bible out of counsel, what's the best alternative? To look at somebody and say, well, you just got to forgive yourself. And the problem is they keep trying to forgive themselves and it keeps coming up and they still feel guilty, they still feel shame, they forgive themselves again and then the same thing happens and it's a vicious cycle because they're not getting the truth, they're not hearing what's right, they're not hearing the very thing that will set them free. And that's the truth of Jesus Christ. You see... <laughs> When we do things as unbelievers as well as believers, and we, 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 but in particular, before we come to Christ, all the things that we've done, you know, I'm trying to be, trying to be careful here. I have talked with people who have had abortions. And the guilt and the shame from having abortions. And in talking to them, they will make phrases and comments. I just can't forgive myself. And I understand what they're trying to say. And as, and, and as graciously and, as, and as, as gently as I can, I try to bring them to this understanding 
of what sin is, how sin deceives, and that when what the decision to abort a child, yes, you understand the ramifications of it now, you know, since years have passed, you're, you're walking in this, and it's just like, it's just like they're just bound, like, how could I have done this? And, and I try to point out, it's just like, no, you don't understand sin. If you understood sin, the question is not how could I have, under, how could I have done this, but the question is, I understand why I did it. I was selfish. I was all these different aspects. I mean, we, we've, t- the way you find true forgiveness is understanding that sin is insurmountable. It's incredible prior to Christ in our life. I mean, the only thing we care about is us. We don't care about other people. We don't care about a child inside of us. So many different things on and on and on. And we live with the agony of this because we, we sit back and we, we think of all the shame and all the guilt. And, and I'm trying to sit back and say, look, I understand what you're trying to say, but if you want true forgiveness, you're not going to find it in yourself. You're going to find it in Jesus Christ and in him alone. You don't need to forgive yourself. What you need to do is ask forgiveness from God and run to him. He will forgive you. He will wipe away your guilt. He will wipe away this stain. He will help you walk you through this process of what you've done. That's where you're going to find hope That's where you're going to find peace, knowing that you've been forgiven by a God who's incredible. And we'll get into this whole aspect of forgiveness in a moment of the parable that Jesus uses. And so this is why I'm saying some of these things on the Bible are going to run countercultural to what is being taught in the world. And in some ways, it's being taught in Christian churches. And I'm trying to bring people out of guilt and shame, not through finding it in themselves, but through finding it in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where you find freedom. That's where you can go and say, Father, forgive me for aborting my child. Father, forgive me. I was wicked. My heart was desperately wicked above all else. I only sought one thing that was my own self-gratification, my own self-purpose, all this other stuff. And I did this, God, See, (laughs) we, prior to Christ, are all depraved. Every aspect of our bodies, our mind, our will, our emotion has been tainted with sin. And the only hope is the gospel. And the only hope is to the only hope for forgiveness is to look to another alternative source, Jesus Christ and the cross, and not try to find forgiveness here. <laughs> it's not here. It's there. And so we want to walk in freedom. We want to walk in truth. We want to walk in knowledge. And so forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not finding self-forgiveness in and of ourselves. And look, again, I understand what they're trying to do. They're just trying to alleviate guilt and shame. And it's not going to alleviate it. Guilt and shame is for a purpose. And that purpose, like I said, is to drive you to the cross. Okay, third thing, forgiveness is not. It is not condoning. We, forgiveness does not excuse bad or hurtful behavior. That's not what we're doing. Okay, we're not, we're not here doing this and saying, oh, okay, yeah, I forgive you, and so that means uh, I'm going to forgive you of the consequences that, that, that are due you. Now, we'll, we'll get into that into a moment as well. So forgiveness is not um, excusing bad or hurtful behavior. That did not happen, remember, with Joseph and his brothers. I mean, his brothers beat him up. They tore off his clothes. They gave, tore off his gift that they threw him in a dungeon. They were going to actually kill him until, until the one brother steps up and says, hey, let's not kill him. Let's sell him as a slave. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. And so at the end of the story, when we get into Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he's, this is what Joseph tells his brothers. As for you, can you imagine them hearing these words? As for you, you meant evil against me, 
You meant evil against me. What you tried to do to me, you threw me in that pit. You beat me up. You treated me like nothing because of your jealousy and your self-righteousness. And what you meant for evil, you, didn't, you weren't after my best intentions. You, what you did, you meant it for evil. But, he says, but God, God meant it for good. What you did to me, you were evil in your actions, and you will pay for your evil actions. But God meant it for good. You see, Joseph had a good picture. Now, he got on the other side of it. I don't know if he was thinking about it when he was in the dungeon and after his brothers beat him up, that God was going to turn this bad situation into something good. But on the other side of it, he saw God's hand in the midst of it. Because God used that situation, as bad as it was, God used that situation to save an entire nation, the nation of Israel. If it wasn't for Joseph and him being sold into slavery, he would have never been bought by Potiphar. He would have never been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into jail. He would have never met the baker and the cup uh, and the cup bearer for the the um, king, and then he works his way up, and then all of a sudden the king has the dream, and you know the story. Joseph interprets the dream, and he becomes the second only to the prime minister, to the king himself. Whatever Joseph tells you to do, do it. And he saves an entire nation of Egypt, and then he saves the entire nation of Israel as well, as they bring their families because of the famine that struck the land. And that's what he says, you meant it for evil. He didn't condone their sin. He didn't condone what they did and say, oh, it was okay, fellas, what you did. Wasn't that bad. It all turned out okay. No, <laughs> he was very clear. You asked for you. <laughs> you meant it for evil, but my God is greater than your evil intentions. And God meant it for good. Fourth thing. Fourth thing is, is that we don't, forgiveness is not dismissing it. it. It means that we don't minimize it. We don't pass it off as insignificant. It means we're not uh, uh, taking the offense seriously against us. That's not, that's what not forgiveness is. No, we take forgiveness serious. Someone, you've been wrong. Someone's hurt you. Someone's done something against you. And so we're going to do this. But forgiveness is also not pardoning. Pardoning is a legal transaction that releases an offender from consequences of their actions. That's not what we do when we forgive somebody. Forgiveness is a personal transaction that releases that individual from the offense that they've done, but they're still going to pay the price for it. Kay and I have a dear friend. This was many years ago. Some of you have heard this story. This woman was a florist. She's a florist in Orlando, dear friend of Kay and I. Uh, she learned to be a florist from her mom. Her mom was in her shop in Orlando uh, doing flowers. And a man walks in, strung out on drugs, robs her, ends up murdering this girl's mom. Uh, they called, you know, she, mom didn't pick up, on and on and on. They had the business next door go over saw her mom laying on the floor, called the police. It was a big, big to-do because this guy then went to another place and killed another individual, another woman, and uh, very tragic situation. And so as we were uh, on staff at the church in Orlando and walking this woman through it, she's dealing with this whole emotion, how do I process, what do I do, different things along those lines. And so uh, it came down to the days of the trial when this guy, uh, they caught the man, and um, on and on. So you had two scenarios take place. You had this woman who lost her mother, and then you had the husband who lost his wife with their children. And so I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this was televised. I know that they showed it on the news media, uh, on the news segment of the day. And so um, this woman, as she gets up, and, and she's standing before her accuser, as you do in a courtroom, you're able to address them. Um, you know, the, the man who killed the woman's mom addressed her and said, please forgive me. 
and he's, I believe he's crying, if I remember correctly, he's crying, asking for forgiveness, and she looks at that man and says, I want you to know my mom would want me to tell you this, and I'm telling you this, but I forgive you, and then proceeds to preach the gospel to this man, that the only reason I can forgive you is because I serve and God has forgiven me of my sin, so therefore I forgive you for what you did to my mother. Yes, you're going to pay for it by being a double murder. He's going to have capital punishment, the whole nine yards. She didn't go on all that, but she forgave that man, okay? So you had this incredible moment. This guy's crying as he's been forgiven. The, the man comes up. He asks for forgiveness from the man. The man says, I will never forgive you. I will never forgive you. You have taken away my wife. You have taken away my children's mother. On and on and on and on and on. And so, you know, I mean, you could just see, you could just see the contrast. But their forgiveness, when she forgave him of his, of his wrongdoing, his murder of her mother, he still had to pay the price by going to jail. And I believe that he was, uh, uh, you know, like I said, on death row for killing two individuals. So when you look at these things, so we're, when we forgive people, we're not pardoning them like, okay, you're not, you're, I'm not going to hold you legally responsible. No, 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 we will. If, if someone sexually assaults someone, we will press charges. We will forgive them, but we're not going to pardon them, that we're going to do that. That's what forgiveness isn't. And then certainly last thing, forgiveness is not reconciliation. It takes people to reconcile, but sometimes the injured party can forgive without the other person being involved, right? I mean, when Jesus is on the cross, <laughs> he didn't look down and say, hey, I forgive you. You guys are going to forgive me? You know, I mean, I, I forgive you for what you've done. Hey, what, what about what you're doing to me? Well, no, it wasn't there. What Jesus did, he said, what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They weren't reconciled at that moment, but Jesus forgave them. And so this is what we're looking at. Now, let's look at what really biblical forgiveness is. So in verse 15 here, or 14 and 15, Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And simply put, Forgiveness is simply this. To forgive someone means to send away or to put away, to cancel a debt, and then, as I mentioned, the legal term is to pardon. And so that's what you're doing. You're canceling that person's debt, that canceling that person's sin. That's why Jesus prays in the prayer, forgive us our debts, forgive us of our sins, so that we also, uh, so that we also have forgiven all our debtors, those who have sinned against us. And so Jesus is very clearly understanding, wants us to understand about what forgiveness is. Primarily this, forgiveness is first vertical, our relationship with God. We have been forgiven by God. God has forgiven us. And then forgiveness moves to be horizontal, meaning that we are to forgive others when we see this. If you would, Go with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, very familiar passage on this topic of forgiveness. I want you to look at it with me. Many of you know this parable. Starting in verse 21, we're going to look at it. And how this parable comes up is the issue of forgiveness. Okay? Look at verse 21, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. What? That's, that's like 490 times in one day. Now, you have to understand something here. <laughs> what, what Peter, you know, you know Peter, he, we love Peter. He's, he's just really rambunctious. I mean, everything about him, he's so impulsive and he, he's great. I love him. And, but what he's doing here is, it, it, according to the law, you, you only had to forgive a person three times. 
three times. And so what Peter's doing, he's, he's kind of like doubling that and throwing an extra one on top. So how many times do we need? My brother keeps sinning against me, Lord. How many times? I, I know what the law is. The law is three times, but what about seven times? I'm being very gracious now. I'm supposed to give three, only three times, but I'm going to forgive seven times. And then Jesus blows his ever-loving mind when he looks at him. He says, no, 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 70 times seven. So 490 times. And he's like, what? And look at his response to this as Peter comes. And then Jesus then tells this parable based on this story of forgiveness. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So let's just say, folks, that's a lot of money. Okay? This guy owed that king a lot of money. You could say, let's just put a trillion dollar figure of modern day on this. Okay? And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and the payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. What an incredible king, right? But when the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants that owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, began to choke him, saying to him, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and he went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servant saw servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went out and reported it to their master, all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Now, 34 and 35 is really where I want to focus on this parable. And in anger, which I think is obviously a righteous anger, not a sinful anger, and in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers. Okay? Underline that word, jailers. And, and they say jailers in the ESV. I believe the NIV case says what? What? Jailer, to as well? It means tormentors. Tormentors. Okay? These jailers are tormentors. Okay? That's significant. I want you to see this. I don't want you to lose sight of that because this part of the parable is the least understood part or the least talked about part. But to me, this is the most significant part. And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers or tormentors until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Now, is that not identical to what Jesus is saying on the Sermon on the Mount? If you don't forgive your brother your trespasses, my Father will not forgive you of your trespasses. You see, this man owed the king like a trillion dollars. He goes out to somebody who may owe him a thousand dollars. And so what Jesus is telling Peter and the disciples when it comes to the issue of forgiveness, he's trying to drive home to them. Not all, this isn't even a part of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is talking about here at this moment. In the Sermon on the Mount, in 14 and 15, he's saying, you got to forgive because your Father is forgiving you. If you don't forgive, then your Father will not forgive you. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And so the idea is this for us as Christians. We 
Our sin is so great that we owe God a trillion dollars. There's no way we're ever going to pay God back. Many people try to earn their salvation. Many people try to live their lives in a way and do good works, and somehow that's going to get them to heaven. Your good works will not get you to heaven. Only faith in Jesus Christ will. And so what he's trying to show us is this, is that we owe God a trillion dollars. There's no way we can pay him back. And when we come to him and ask him for forgiveness, and he forgives us of our debts, then when you and I walk in our life daily, and we run across somebody who may have done something wrong to us, and hurt us, sexually abused us, all these different things that go on in our world that is full of evil, full of sin, full of people who don't know God, full of people who could care less about God, all they want, and then some people being demonically influenced, all these different aspects. And so here these people are that come to us and hurt us, and if we are like that man that that person owes us a thousand dollars and we grab them and choke them. I'm not going to forgive you for what you did to me. And then we throw them in jail and we don't forgive them. Then, then that's what God does. He looks at us and says, look, you wicked servant. Didn't I forgive you of a trillion dollars and you can't forgive this individual of a thousand bucks? You see the discrepancy? And this is why Jesus says it's so important for us to be men and women of forgiveness. We live life like this. This is how we are to be. We are to be the most forgiving people. Now remember, remember what the six things that forgiveness is not. All those things in the process. But when we forgive, we release that person and you and I will walk in a newfound freedom. You know what? Here's the funny thing about it. This is what unforgiveness is. This is what I found with about unforgiveness in my own life. At times growing up as a child and my background with my father leaving and on and on and what I had to wrestle with with that. This is what I, I heard this when I was at, walking this journey and it stuck with me forever. I don't know who, I can't remember who said it. Don't know if I read it, whatever the case may be. But it said, this, it said this, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That, that, that's what unforgiveness is. It's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You see, that's what happened to me. <laughs> I had such unforgiveness, hatred, bitterness, resentment, name it, whatever you want to, toward my father. As I'm sitting there at a youth meeting, there's a thousand kids there. I'm sitting there listening to this. The preacher is preaching. It's like this guy and I are having this conversation. <laughs> it's like one-on-one. -on -one. It's like and there's nobody else there. And I'm sitting there thinking, my God, that man's talked to my mom. That's what I'm thinking as a teenager. I'm, I'm, I'm at this age, I'm probably... Oh, I'm probably 14, 15 years old. And this man is preaching the gospel. This man basically is preaching this message that I'm preaching to you. And he's sharing this parable like I'm sharing with you. And as I'm sitting there among a thousand kids, and I'm thinking I'm having this one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, that preacher, and me, and the Lord... And the Lord is using him to speak to me. And as I sat there and I'm in that meeting, I could just, I could feel my t the eyes rolling up and I'm saying, oh God. And at 15, roughly 15 years old, I'm sitting in that meeting. I know exactly where it was. I could tell you to this day, I could take you to the spot where I was sitting. Because I will never forget it. And as I sat there, and I listened to this parable, and then all of a sudden, it came down to where you got to forgive. And everything inside of me didn't want to. But when I, when I said these words, 
Father, you know what happened. You know what I've been dealing with. I forgive my father. And at that moment, at that moment, I felt inside of me like something, like there was a rope around my heart. And all of a sudden, that thing just went, it was gone. It was gone. All of a sudden, I could breathe differently. All of a sudden, I was lighter. It was like, it was like the poison of unforgiveness. You know what was so crazy? Here's the crazy thing about it. My dad was still living his life, enjoying life, doing what he wanted to do. He wasn't worried about me. I mean, he might have been. I mean, we never talked. I don't know. He wasn't worried about me. I was the one that was bound up. I was the one, I was the one drinking the poison thinking that he's going to die when I was the one who was dying. And I sat back and I look at this and I said, oh, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. I'm the one who was dying. I'm the one who was missing God. I was the one. And, and folks, from that point on, from that point on, my life has never been the same, and I've never looked at forgiveness. I've never held forgiveness toward anyone. If anything, I am the most gracious forgiver. I mean, I, I, I am. You can talk to my wife. You can ask her. I mean, I, I don't hold anything against anybody. I've been there, done that. I've drank the poison. I'm not drinking it again. I don't want this element here coming up. And now, that was at 15 years old that happened to me. And as I began to study forgiveness, I began to look and read books on it. I'm going through and I'm saying, yeah, what about, what about forgetting? What about, what about self-forgiveness? What about all this? And I say, oh, that, that, that's a wonderful, helpful things, I'm sure. But it's not the truth. I need the truth. Give me the truth. The truth is, Phil, right here, the unforgiving servant, if you can't forgive him of a thousand bucks your father forgave you of a trillion dollars. You never could pay him back. He's forgiving you. You must forgive him because if you don't, what? You're going to be turned over to the jailers. You're going to be turned over to the tormentors. If you do not forgive, you got this promise from Jesus right here. The promise from Jesus is if you don't forgive, I'm turning you over to the jailers. That's not in your promise box, is it? The little promise box, you know what a promise box is? You got all the promises of God in a little box and you pull it out and read it for the day. It's a little encouraging scripture of who you are. That promise isn't in there in the promise box. But that's a promise from Jesus. <laughs> you don't think so? I mean, he's just quoting it here. If you do not forgive, your father will not forgive you. And Jesus is again saying, look, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Man. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus is serious about forgiveness? He's serious, isn't he? Why is he serious? Because he wants us walking in freedom. He wants us walking in freedom. I have never been more freer than when the day I forgave my dad. I have never walked in such freedom before in my entire life. I eventually met my, my father left when I was five years old, and I didn't see my father again till I was 32. And I didn't know how I was going to respond to him when I did this. I didn't know what was going to happen in the midst of this. I really didn't have this desire inside of me to go hunt my dad down, to forgive him and all that. I just said, nah, not going to do that. But my sisters did. <laughs> they wanted to find their father. And it was fine. You go find him. I don't need to find him. I'm okay. And they said, well, no, okay, we'll go find him. And they, it was more of a, you know, we want to meet him, say hey to him, all these things. And you know, find out medical history. And I said, yeah, yeah, okay, I got all that. And it's just a desire of their heart to do that. And it was wonderful. Well, they found him. And then they come to me and they say, guess what? We found our dad. I said, praise God, when y'all gonna meet him? I said, well, we're not. We want you to call him. Me? 
I didn't want to find him in the first place. And now you want me to call him. Well, before you call him, we need you to talk to mom about it. Because, you know, hey, because <laughs> you're the preacher. So therefore, we want you to talk to mom to tell mom that we found our dad and we want to meet our dad. I'm like, oh, my Lord, are you kidding me? Don't you just love sisters? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and so I, I, said, I said, all right, I'll go talk to mom. And I talked to my mom. And my mom, if ever, if ever there was a godly woman, I went to her, told her what her daughters wanted to do. <laughs> and my mom said, I get it. I understand. Yeah, let's do it. Let's have him over. Let's have him over. I said, wow. Okay. That was unexpected. And then, so I, I told my sisters, mom's fine with that. I say, okay. And then I say, well, we want you to call our dad. I'm like, you want me to call him? I mean, how do you call a man that left you at five years old? I was five. She was seven. Ladon was just born. Mike was three. 27 years later, how do you, how do you talk? Uh, hey, this is your long lost son. You know, I mean, is that one of these things? And uh, so <laughs> I, just, I just said, okay, I'll call him. And as I'm dialing the phone, I, we didn't have cell phones back then, kids, okay? Didn't have Facebook. He could keep up with us, different things like that. This was real world life. And so as I called this man, it really was the grace of God. Because I knew, I mean, Ken and I knew, Ken and I went on our honeymoon, and we're in Sea Island, Georgia, and we go to the grocery store, and and as I'm go, we go back to the meat counter, and all of a sudden the meat manager's name is Paul Corson. That's my dad's name. Paul Corson. And I went, oh my Lord. Now I don't know what my dad looks like. It's been 27 years. Well, at that time when we got married, it was probably 20 years. He could be my dad. Dad, can I have some steaks? No, I'm kidding. I'm just the meat manager. He was my dad. So 27 years later, so I get on the phone and I call him and he picks up and he says, hello? And I said, you dirty rat. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I said, just throwing that off. I looked at it and I said, he said, hello? And I said, is this Paul Corson? He said, yes. And I said, this is your son, Phil. And he goes, hello, Philip. And I said, we as a family would like to get together if you would like to get together. Now, the last time when I was five, I think my dad sent a letter, maybe when I was a little older, if I can remember. The last I heard where he was, he was in Ohio. He had moved back to Orlando. Basically, he lived roughly 15 minutes from me for years. For years. And so we, we met, had a great time, reconciled. I set the parameters, said, look, it's been 27 years. We're going to meet. We don't need to bring up the past. That's forgiven. All these things walking through. The journey there. I knew one day the Lord would bring him back into my life just because of the aspects of what was going on inside of me. But I want you to know, I mean, I had children by that time. Stephen, I think, was born. And then I have a half, found out I have a half-sister uh, who is... He's, so I've got Stephen and Brandon. I think she is after Brandon, age-wise. So I'm introducing this little girl to my son saying, hey, meet your Aunt Shelby. <laughs> They're like, huh? What do you mean? I'm older than her. So anyway, the freedom, though, the point is the freedom that has come as a result of this. The studying of scriptures and the issue of unforgiveness in particular, and how Jesus deals with this, has always been 
monumental to me. I have lived this way since 15 years old because I know that what left me was the tormentors. That's what I was set free from. The minute I said, Father, forgive my, I forgive my dad, Whew, it was gone. They didn't think anything was controlling me. All I know is I was just bound up in a way that I didn't know I was. And so this issue of forgiveness is something that is incredible as far as what we see here. I want to give you other scriptures that the Apostle Paul and others give to us. It says this, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as in God, as God in Christ forgave you, Ephesians 4, 32. These are verses that help me walk through my journey. And the worship team can go ahead and come on up. Another one, James chapter 2, verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you're not going to show mercy to someone, mercy will not be shown to you because judgment will come. And then this one was always helpful for me in the book of Proverbs. It says this, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression or a sin. And that's what I prayed in my life. Overlooking it in the sense of forgiving it, not holding on to it, recognizing that my dad was an unbeliever. He probably didn't know what he was doing. He walked down many journeys and roads on a self. You know, it was just a crazy, crazy time. You know, the great thing about it, though, is this, through that, after that initial meeting, we had my dad over. My dad ended up, he's an alcoholic, uh, just didn't live a good life. And, um, you know, had him over to the house and just different things like that. And we were able to connect a little bit, share the gospel with him a little bit. And then he goes in and lived his life for retirement, right? We all do. 65, he quit his job. He was retiring. We talked about how he was excited about retirement. Went in for routine surgery. And a blood clot hit his heart. Put him in a coma. <laughs> and this is the crazy thing about it, right? I get a call from the hospital. Me. He puts my name down. Not his other wife's name. He puts my name down. That was just weird and crazy. So I get the call that my dad is in the hospital. So we all go up. We see my dad in the hospital, and he's in a coma. And I, we go in, and we talk to him, and I'm talking to him. And it's like, look, you've been forgiven by us. What's your relationship with Jesus? I don't know if he's hearing me. I don't know where my dad is to this day. If he's in heaven or if he's in hell, don't know. But you see the freedom? You see the freedom? I mean, guys, I'm walking around in freedom and the promises of God and all these things because I forgave. And I don't want any of you to live your life. Young person, if you're in here listening to this message, understand the power of forgiveness. It's powerful. Why is it powerful? Because God is the one who forgave you. He is the example. He is the, the epitome of forgiveness. That's who he is. He is a merciful, loving, kind, compassionate God who is your father. And all you have to do is cry out to them and say, God, I owe you a trillion dollars. There's no way I could ever pay you back. But I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I have reconciled with you. You see, Passion Week, you see, Passion Week, we're leading up to Resurrection Sunday next week. Passion Week, Jesus is going to be all about forgiveness. It's going to be all about forgiveness this week. It's going to be incredible. 
So let's all stand. But just with every head bowed and every eye closed for a moment, maybe as I was speaking, the Lord was bringing somebody to your mind. Someone that you need to forgive. Someone that, that maybe you may not need to go to them like I didn't have to go to my dad or anything like that. But on the other side of it is maybe God wants you to go to them. But minimally, you have something in your heart against them. And God wants you to release them of that debt, of that hurt, of that pain. And he wants you to find grace and forgiveness in him. And then he wants, to walk, he wants you to walk in forgiveness. And so, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, you work in our life. And I pray, oh God, that you would come. And Holy Spirit, right now, I pray and I ask, Lord God, that whoever it is that is in our hearts or minds at this moment, as we say their name, God, say, I forgive. You guys say that. I forgive and whoever it is. Holy Spirit, do your work. Do what only you can do. Because you are an amazing, awesome and forgiving God. Thank you that we can't do this in of ourselves, but we need to be empowered supernaturally to forgive. And then God, let us walk in this newfound freedom. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing this song, uh, Build My Life, right? In the bridge part where it says, I will build my life upon your word. It talks about that. For it is a firm foundation. It's how we've got to build our lives. We've got to build our lives, our lives of forgiveness on this aspect of forgiveness. So let's pray and worship, or not pray, but let's worship the Lord together.